Mr. Secretary General, welcome on behalf of UN News. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And you have just returned from a lot of travels. We're speaking here on the cusp of the 78th General Assembly session, where a record number of world leaders are expected. But from the P5, only one head of state. And that, of course, is the permanent members of the Security Council I'm referring to. What does it say about the UN as a center of diplomacy at a time when there are crises on so many fronts? Well, first of all, this is not a vanity fair. No, this is a political body in which governments are represented. And uh, what matters is that they are represented by someone that can assume the commitments that are necessary at the present moment. So I'm not so worried about who's coming. What I'm worried is that to make sure that countries are here and they are ready to assume the commitments that are necessary to make the sustainable development goals that unfortunately are not moving in the right direction to make them a reality. And uh, for that, we need to have commitments on a number of very important things. First, to recognize that we have an unjust, uh, a dysfunctional and outdated international financial system that needs to be reformed. Uh, second, uh, we have uh, made a proposal of an SDG stimulus. We need 500 billion US dollars that are necessary to make sure that developing countries that are drowning in debt, that have no fiscal space, that have no access uh, to uh, concessional funding, many of them because they are middle income countries, or to long term funding because they lost uh, um, uh, th that possibility to make sure that countries will have the resources that they need in order to make the sustainable development goals a reality. Uh, Africa today spends more money servicing the debt than in education. So this shows how much we need to transform an unfair international global system to make sure that the sustainable development goals become a reality. And on the other hand, this will be uh, the right place for countries to come and assume commitments in relation to peace. We have so many crises around the world. We need a much stronger commitment of the international community in favor of peace. And uh, we have climate, and uh, we have uh, uh, an ambition uh, climate summit uh, in which uh, we are asking countries and we are asking companies and we are asking uh, civil society and others to come and to present their engagement with new projects, with new commitments able to reverse the present trend in which climate change is out of control, as we know. We are moving to 2.6 to 2.8 degrees of a global uh, temperature rise in the end of the century. We need to get back to our objective, 1.5. We are still on time. It's still possible with political will, but a lot needs to be done. Uh, phasing uh, out fossil fuels, a lot needs to be done in investments in renewable energy, a lot needs to be done uh, in many other areas of the economies and the societies for us to be able to avoid the present trend that we can already see natural disasters multiplying and becoming more devastating everywhere. Drought uh, that is uh, transforming entire areas in um, areas where human life can no longer take place. Um, we see the rising sea level accelerating with the melting in Greenland, the melting in Antarctica. So it's time to act decisively. And that is the reason of this Climate Ambition Summit in the preparation of the COP. All these things require member states to be strongly engaged, but require also the civil society to be present, to be vibrant. And in the weekend uh, that uh, precedes the, uh, the high level week, we are having a fantastic presence of the business community and the civil society here in the UN. And that is a demonstration that beyond governments, there is a lot of political will in favor of the sustainable development goals, in favor of justice in the world, and in favor of climate action. You mentioned the Climate Ambition Summit, and uh, quite unusually, uh, those who've been invited to speak are those with credible net zero plans. So many are wondering, why did you choose this rather innovative approach? I think it's important uh, to have campaigns involving everybody, to have initiatives involving everybody, but it's important to give opportunities to those that are the frontliners, to those that are uh, the most committed 
uh, to uh, climate action, uh, those that have the good practices, it's important to give them an opportunity to show what they are doing for the others to be able to learn and to copy. So switching gears, in this action-packed week, you have the Sustainable Development Summit kicking off the week. You have the Climate Ambition Summit on Wednesday, but you also have three summits focusing on global health. You have the one on tuberculosis, which still kills large numbers of people. You have one on universal health coverage, and for the first time ever, one on pandemic preparedness. So what do you think, I mean, uh, coming out of COVID-19, we saw a tremendous lack of solidarity and inequity where many nations had really very little access to life-saving medical equipment, to vaccines. This had impact on geopolitical relationships. So what do you th think needs to happen on the global public health front? Well, first of all, universal health coverage is an essential objective of the UN. And uh, it requires not only our systems to work, it requires also financial systems uh, to be much more fair than what they are today. Uh, and uh, there are central questions to be addressed uh, uh, in relation to intellectual property, in, in the way the pharmaceutical industry operates. Uh, let's not forget that 90% of the investment that is made in pharmaceutical products is essentially for the diseases that are predominant in the North and only 10% for diseases that are predominant in the South. So there are basic structural inequalities in the way the system works. And one of the things that I believe is essential is increase the resources and the power of the World Health Organization. And this is also very important for uh, pandemics preparedness. Um, uh, we must have a World Health Organization with a much stronger influence in the way uh, decisions are taken, in the way information is put at the disposal of everybody and shared and in the way uh, uh, international action is coordinated, responding to pandemics, but also addressing uh, what are the most dramatic health problems in the world and tuberculosis that many have forgotten, uh, still remains a very dramatic source of suffering in today's world. Now, you've spoken of some extremely major challenges that need to be confronted, but I think, uh, we are all aware that the war in Ukraine is going to loom large over this General Assembly session. The UN offers a theater for diplomacy. How do you see the potential of dialogue leading to peace? And do you have hope, I think you always have hope, but do you have hope that um, there is a way to resurrect the Black Sea Initiative, which brought relief to millions of people around the world? Well, we are working hard in order to make it happen. We are working hard in order to make sure that there is full access of uh, Ukrainian and Russian food and fertilizers to global markets. That is absolutely essential, but we do not minimize the difficulties and the obstacles in the very uh, dramatic uh, situation we have today in the Black Sea after the end of the Russian participation in the Black Sea Initiative. Uh, on the other hand, the, the essential objective is peace. But peace must be just, and peace must be in line with UN Charter and in line with international law. And um, uh, to be honest, I do not think in this General Assembly the conditions are met to have a serious dialogue on peace. I think the parties are far uh, from uh, that possibility at the present moment. But we will never, never stop our efforts to make sure that peace comes to the Ukraine a just peace in line with the Charter and in line with international law, because the war in Ukraine is today a major factor of increasing geopolitical tensions, and the increase of geopolitical tensions is a major reason for us not to be able to address effectively the challenges of the present times. Climate change and the uh, risks of disruptions caused by new technologies for which there is not uh, an effective global governance system. Artificial intelligence is a case in point. It can bring enormous benefits to mankind, to humankind, but it can be a source of risks that need to be mitigated. Unfortunately, at the present moment, the world is not united 
facing these challenges. And that is why it's so important that the war in Ukraine ends, because it is one of the factors that is undermining the capacity of the world to come together.